match in the way that it was brought about. Uh, how we got to this point is not something that he's especially pleased with. Uh, and asceticism in particular, although it has, he thinks, in part created this sovereign individual, I've said before, now, like these days, now that it's accomplished its purpose of making sovereign individuals who are responsible, now that same asceticism threatens to collapse the whole structure. That asceticism threatens to um, undermine itself. Nihilism is something that's a genuine threat because of this. Okay, so somehow or other, asceticism has created something of immense value, the sovereign individual, but now has been in danger, has become in danger to all values. Um, page 38, got the middle of the page. The worse humanity was at memory, the more terrible is the appearance of its practice, practices. The harshness of penal laws in particular provides a measuring stick for the amount of effort it took to achieve victory over forgetfulness and to keep a few primitive requirements of social coexistence present for the slaves of momentary affect and desire. So we can look at how cruel, how harsh the punishments that a society inflicts on itself, on its members, as a, gate, as, a, uh, as a way of measuring how irresponsible its citizens are. So when individuals are slaves of their passions and are not able to commit on their say-so to carrying out their uh, wills in the future, there needs to be a harsh imposition of penalties to get them to act properly. Conversely, when societies are composed of strong, responsible individuals who are permitted to make promises and vouch for themselves, those harsh external sanctions and penalties are pointless. They're unnecessary. They're merely cruel. Um, and so Nietzsche thinks that we can gauge the strength of individuals by looking at those external sanctions. Um, he doesn't say this, but you can think about the internalization of this kind of strength um, as a kind of movement from hypothetical imperatives to a categorical imperative. So if we are moved only by the desires that we happen to have, well, there need to be external levers, external forces to get us to act in the proper way on the basis of a hypothetical imperative, on the basis of the desires that we have flowing through the channels of external constraint to a certain outcome. So in other words, if we've committed to something and we're unable to discipline ourselves, there have to be strong sanctions, external sanctions, for violating those commitments, punishments for violating uh, And so then, if we're weak in this way, we're going to figure out which path is going to achieve our satisfaction, our desires. We're going to see over there the threat of punishment. So we're going to take a different path and maybe keep our promise. But when we are disciplined internally, when we are not moved by the desires as they come over us, but are able to act to keep our promises because we recognize that's what's required of us, that that's an expression of our strength. It's not in response to any kind of external sanction. So 
the idea of a categorical imperative is like being strong enough, having an extended will that allows you to act in this way, keep your promises, for its own sake, not in order to avoid some kind of external sanction. Okay, um, so we can think of um, the strength of a society sort of inversely related to the harshness of its, of its external sanctions. The harshness of its external sanctions. A strong society with um, sovereign individuals able to make, genu make and keep genuine commitments will not need especially cruel sanctions and penalties. A society of weak individuals who are slaves to their passions, who are buffeted around by what they happen to feel like doing at any given moment, will require harsh and brutal external sanctions. And at the bottom of page 38, uh, he singles out Germany, Germans, for their especially harsh and brutal punishments, um, which implies um, shows the weakness at the heart of um, German culture. Uh, top of 39. With the help of such images and processes, so this is brutal, external, painful sanction. <coughs> With the help of such Im images and processes, one finally retains in memory five or six I will nots, in connection with which one has given one's promise in order to live with the advantage of society. So we've uh, somehow or other given a promise to not do this, not do that, not do the other thing, in exchange for being able to live within the advantages of society. Should I say that with the help of these brutal punishments for violation, sanctions for violation, one finally retains in one's memory, I will not, five or six commandments, not to do these things, in connection with which one is given one's promise in order to live within the advantages of society. And truly, with the help of this kind of memory, one finally came to reason. Ah, reason. Seriousness, mastery over the affects, desires, and inclinations. This entire gloomy matter called reflection, all these prerogatives and showpieces of man, how dearly they have been paid for, how much blood and horror there is at the base, the origin, of all these good things. Okay. Um, I just want to highlight one thing that might seem pretty odd here, and that is that Nietzsche seems to be invoking a kind of social contract at, um, at the sort of base of society, a promise to live, a, a promise in order to live within the advantages of society. You might not expect Nietzsche to be talking about a social contract, um, but that is what he's talking about here, and it's something we're going to come back to later. Okay, so this is the origin of conscience. Something that, I should say again, that Nietzsche has only the highest respect for, although the process of generating it was absolutely brutal and very, very costly. He says, I mean, untold amounts of pain and suffering have gone into making the sovereign individual, one who can discipline oneself. And given human psychology, Nietzsche thinks, um, the way this responsibility came about was, he says, gruesome, repulsive, and cruel. But given human psychology, that's the only way that it could have happened. I guess I should say, conscience here is not a body part. It's not like a section of the brain or something like this. It's a capacity. It's a, it's a strength. It's what allows us to stay on track and keep our commitments, not get um, distracted by impulses and desires as they come over us. Um, and this has been the creation of something, 
sorry, the process of creating this has been brutal, uh, a story of suffering. Um, but what has come out, the fruit of this creation, is immensely valuable. Okay, what I want to say now is um, we don't yet have a picture of how this conscience relates to the moral system of values. I haven't yet, and it hasn't yet been talking about morality. We've been talking about the prehistory of various mores, values, in different societies. We don't yet have a picture of morality. Here it comes, section four. He says, but how then did that other gloomy thing, the consciousness of guilt, the entire bad conscience, come into the world? And thus we return to our genealogists of morality. Okay, so the, so the question now is about this other thing. We've been talking about having a conscience. Now we're talking about something else, what he calls consciousness of guilt or bad conscience. Consciousness of guilt or bad conscience or what we might think of as a guilty conscience or just guilt is different than having a conscience. Let me say that again. Having a guilty conscience or feeling guilty or what he calls here bad conscience or consciousness of guilt, all those are the same. All of those are different from or maybe interpretations of the idea of conscience. And all of these are aspects of morality. So guilt is an aspect of morality. It's maybe, of, it's maybe morality's interpretation here. Um, and suffering from guilt, or having a guilty conscience, returns us now to the question of morality, which we have been talking about before. Um, so guilt, or guilty conscience, or Bad conscience is not to be confused with the conscience of the sovereign individual in general. Um, okay, so look, we'll pick up a uh, track here by seeing the moralized version here um, next Monday. So have a good break. I have papers to return to you.